Mic on. Mic on. Proud as Mitchu. Mitchu, that's right. Here we go. I am looking forward to this. A um, little, some personal stories, uh, so that they don't talk about me first. <laughs> that my relationship with the Buffalo Bisons goes back to my Phillips Lytle attorney days, which still exist, uh, and my relationship with then General Counsel Bill Giesel. And I was a guy who not shy about trying to get into places you're not supposed to get into. And it goes back to the old timers day at the rock pile. Um, and I called Bill, who was at, prior to that time was with Phillips Lytle as a young associate with me, to seeing if I could get a press pass. Next thing you know, I got a press pass. Next thing you know, there's all this Larry Dobies and, and uh, Jack and uh, uh, Hank Aaron and Willie Mays and everybody. And I'm just having a field day on the, and on the field. And along the way, not only do I get a chance to uh, thank Bill Giesel, but I meet a guy named Mike Bellani, and Mike Bellani uh, never shy about anything, anywhere, anytime. Uh, in fact, uh, wanted to know more about me and I, him, and collectively he was permitted me to be on the field for several of the signature events uh, of the Buffalo Bisons, including day one, which was a magical day, uh, other bison, several old timers days, several AAA All Star games, and Mike. I, I don't know if he he just he just thank you know he was one of those guys who saw that there's a crazy partner of a Phillips Lytle law firm out there doing things that nobody should be doing, uh, but there it is. They just smiled and let that happen, and that that really started a long long relationship between me personally and the Buffalo Bisons. Along the way, it found uh, the fact that Larry Parrish, Larry Parrish, mm -hmm. who was the manager of the Niagara Falls Rapids, where it's down here, Russ Dietrich and I interviewed him during the course of that interview. Uh, I think it was 1993 at the end, maybe September of 1993. Larry mentioned to Russ and I, oh, I see that you're not gonna have a team next year. Just out of the blue. And I go, what? kind of looked at each other, completed the interview, and wondered, what was that about? So the rumors had surely been circulating in Niagara Falls at that time. Uh, shortly thereafter, like within a week, that became reality when the announcements came that the Montreal Expos, who owned the Jamestown Expos, had sold the franchise to Burlington, Vermont. That Sunday morning, a phone call from Bill Giesel to me, saying, guess what, sorry to announce, but, you know, uh, your franchise yesterday was transferred to Burlington, Vermont, and then a conversation about the possibility of maybe Niagara Falls could come down here, which then called, I called him Sam, which then Bob Rich, Mike Bellani, a whole lot of people got the three mayoral candidates at the time, uh, all in one room on a Monday morning to see if they were to make the move from Niagara Falls here. Uh, that would become a re reality, and that to make sure that there was not any political surprises. Sam was in the room, I was in the room, others were in the room, and they all said so. And that's where I'm gonna stop, because there's a backstory. There's a backstory of how baseball came from Buffalo to Jamestown, and Mike Bellani, uh, he has a long resume, and I'm really not gonna bore you, but he was really there in the Bison's front office from really 1983, right. Uh, right through 1996, and was in the middle of everything. I mean, everything. Uh, but as far as Jamestown's concerned, I, I'd like you to share the story, Mike, because it is way too CSI-ish. CSI, interesting. Um, well, thank you. A pleasure to be back in Jamestown, where uh, uh, my adopted home and, you know, the dungeons of sea, again, it's just... Uh, you know, so great, and thank you, and, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, baseball of uh, Jamestown, you know, Russ, it's just tremendous what you have uh, done here, and all the rest of uh, here. You know, June, as a business um, leader of this team, I'm sure if you ever get a question from any of the investors on how they might be able to make a small fortune 
by owning a, uh, a piece of this franchise. Um, use Bob Rich's uh, line, you have to begin with a large fortune. <laughs> um, but Greg, going back to, uh, it's interesting, this collegiate league um, has, as your commissioner, Robert Julian. Uh, back in 1993, the, uh, Major League Baseball came out with standards that the locker, that the facilities had to be uh, up to a certain level. And each level, um, short season A, full season A, double A, um, and it was mostly around the locker rooms. Obviously the field, but you know, mostly the locker rooms. I mean, these are young professional athletes that have been signed like these players here. Hopefully in the next year or so they'll be signed. They'll go to affiliated baseball if we still have that in the next couple of years. But uh, so that was what was happening throughout the New York Penn League. And Robert Julian was the commissioner, the league president. And Niagara Falls, we played at Old Sal Magley Stadium. And it was not in great shape. And it needed to be upgraded substantially because essentially it's a high school you know, stadium. So uh, we knew that there may be some issues with the mayor because we didn't have a Sam Teresi as a mayor there. So that's when we called here, just hedging our bets of if things didn't work out that well. And we had a, le a meeting, Bob Julian and I, with the mayor on a Thursday, and the following night, Friday, was the league meeting where we would you know, solidify the franchises for the uh, 1994 uh, season. Um, we go in to meet with the mayor, and we're waiting, waiting. He finally shows up, and he's like, well, and he's got a long cigar, and he had his brother, and he said, look, here, the suits are here. They think they're going to, you know, um, bamboozle old Jake. So we sit in the meeting, and it's not starting very well. So we cut right to the chase. You either make these improvements at X number of dollars or we're going to move the team. Well, that triggered him. And he said, nobody threatens Jake Palillo. And I said, well, that's great. Are you going to make the changes? No, we're not making the changes. You're not going anywhere. OK. Said, thank you very much. We walk out. And as we're walking down the stairs to our car, I called Greg and said, we're going to move at tomorrow night's meeting that we're going to ask the league to vote on the transfer of the uh, Niagara Falls Rapids to uh, Jamestown. And then it was a unanimous uh, decision, and that Friday night we are now home in Jamestown. As you might uh, guess, the, the various points uh, along this long legacy of, of Jamestown baseball, there have been tipping points, points where it could have gone several ways. Uh, Russ was in the middle of many of them. Mike Bellani certainly is, was in the middle of that moment in time. Uh, the next thing you know, John Dandies, Mike Bellani, Sam Teresi, City Council all met at the literally the ballpark and signed that transfer documents. Uh, with, with, within a week. I mean, literally, it was, I think Sam was in a, within a week, and that all happened. And but Mike, Jeff, Greg, interestingly, though, the franchise goes to Burlington, Vermont, and becomes known as the uh, Vermont Lake Monsters, of which they're still operating. <clears throat> they're under a threat of Major League Baseball wanting to maybe eliminate the, uh, some of the New York Penn League uh, franchises. And I think that threat will probably be backed off because of uh, the one owner who was pushing for these cuts at the minor league level is the owner of the Houston Astros. So right now, I don't think he's got much credibility. So I think because of his antics, uh, minor league baseball, as we know, it may stay for a little while. But the Lake Monsters, one of, the off, one of the season ticket holders is that you talk about how everything goes full circle, is a fellow named Jim Overfield. Hmm. And his father was Joe Overfield, who um, was a historian of the Buffalo Bisons, and in 1985 wrote this book, The 100 Seasons of Buffalo Baseball. You can't find it anymore. But I happen to find one, and I know Greg lent his out, and he can't, they didn't return it. So there's That's your the copy. copy, by the way. 
Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I gave it to you. But oh, now, thank you. This, I, I have it. Yes, it was gone. Thank you very much. How it goes even more full circle is that this past year, I was in Burlington and went to a Lake Monster game because I'm presently working with Joe Overfield's son, Jim Overfield, on publishing, taking the sequel of his dad's book in 1985 of the 100 seasons of Buffalo baseball. And this is the seasons of Buffalo baseball that will be out in... Uh, June of this year, and it dates back to uh, the history of Buffalo baseball in 1850 is when it began, and this has it all every season from 1877 on. So, Greg, you have, that isn't the finished copy, but that's pretty close to what it's going to look like. You'll have to sign it. This is unbelievable. It's already signed. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you very much. By the way, Mike uh, has agreed to come to a continuing legal education program. We always have those sports figures that come here on May 20th, George, so make sure you clear your calendar. Um, so, Mike, when you, 1994 was our first event, and part of that first of a year, there was a community naming of the uh, logo. Could you tell me what... How, what transpired there? Because I must tell you, I thought I was pretty close to the action. That's a complete mystery to me. Well, we, you know, uh, moving into a, a community, and I think we did this when, uh, well, you, you have to step back a bit. Um, in 1983, well, really, the fall of 1982, I was a sports writer for the Courier Express in Buffalo when it had two papers. Uh, my career began as a sports writer. Um, I began covering our high school sports in 1970. Um, probably these young players, their parents weren't even born then. But um, I, our summer baseball team, we would go in to record the scores at the recreation department, and they had a place you could fill out the box scores. So I played, but I also loved keeping stats, and that's why I filled it out. And they said, put one sentence in, which I did. And the next day, that sentence appeared, word for word. So learning the power of the pen, the next game, I put two sentences in. Then it be, we knew we had a team who was going to win every game. So then the, the goal was to get the headline every game. So I just wrote more and more. And the editor called and said, who is this person writing? It turns out my high school didn't have a correspondence, so I ended up writing about it. So in 1982, the Courier Express closed. And the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle hired me because uh, they wanted to come into Buffalo. And they were owned by Gannett. So I'm ready to leave to go there in February 1 of 93 to uh, cover the Rochester Red Wings and then in the fall go to USA Today and be part of their NFL coverage team because they had just started USA Today. Well, the Monday before, one week before I'm supposed to leave, they said, we got a problem. A guy from uh, Kansas City wants to move back here, um, and he's already covering baseball. You don't have any baseball in your portfolio. And I said, well, we only have this little double-A team. He uh, said, just write me a story. So I call up Vince McNamara, who's been down here a number of times, a former president of the New York Penn League, and he said, well, there is an interesting story going on. The president of the Eastern League is in Buffalo, and at the time, the mayor of Buffalo, Jimmy Griffin, brought baseball back to Buffalo in 1979, and in 1982, they were basically out of money. And for 82 games, they only drew 77,077 people. And he said, if the league president, if there isn't a local owner found by Thursday, we lose the franchise. And I don't think it would have ever come back. So I wrote the story, and it was uh, obviously they used it as a front-page story because Buffalo and Rochester had about 90 years of... Uh, um, rivalry going on, and I follow the story through, and it turns out Bob Rich was the only local person interested. I write that story. Thursday, he goes in, he makes a pitch, and um, the only one in there, so they wanted to keep baseball, so they sold it to him, and um, I was his, he came back on Monday, the day I was supposed to leave. He called me up, made me an offer I couldn't refuse, so he was his first local associate along with you know, much like Frank, a staff of three running that place at old War Memorial Stadium. And that's when we started. But he had three goals. And, you know, this is what, how you become a billionaire. Um, you set goals and you work them. 
And uh, his first goal was to uh, get us from double A to triple A as quickly as we can. But the only way we can is if we fill these seats. And we've got to get people into the ballpark. Number two, he would work with the mayor on getting a new stadium built downtown. And number three, there was hints of Major League Baseball coming in an expansion. He said, if we get that stadium, I will work on getting Major League Baseball here to Buffalo. So he hit two out of three. And, um, you know, it, it's unfortunate the Buffalo News portrayed it that he wasn't really interested in bringing in Major League Baseball. There's a backstory of how they came to that assumption, and it was so far from the truth. He spent over a million dollars of his own money on getting us to Major League Baseball. He instilled in our minds everything we did would be done at a big league level, and that's what we brought here when we came to Jamestown. And um, I sat in there. He brought the owners of to one of those um, old-timers games that we didn't let Greg into the owner's box to take pictures. But one of those games, he invited the owners of the Montreal Expos, the Brofmans. And um, to show you the type of guy he is of, you know, their own Seagram's liquor. And he had John Dandies, he said, I want the back bar in our suite filled with every product they have. And so he did, except there was one product that was almost impossible to find. Bob said, find it. And sure enough, Brofman comes in and he's very impressed. Went right to the one item that was the hardest to find and said, how did you find this? And we also called and found out what they liked to eat. So from that standpoint, we had them won over. And Bob made them an offer of, uh, I think it was 50 million bucks or something at the time. And he said, you know, I'd love to, he said, you're the people I'd sell to. I'd love to sell to you, but they'd run me out of Montreal. And eventually they did, and, uh, but we tried to get that team, and then on, in expansion they went to two other cities. But um, their commitment was to make, as part of the major league, is how we got into this, is that they wanted to be the first owners to own their entire farm system, from short season A all the way up, and then at spring training have a community around the ballpark because they already the rich has already owned a golf course in Lake Worth Florida and they had you know condos in that around there so they knew that type of the business they're in the food service business we ran our own concessions um, so we got the New York Penn League team in Niagara Falls uh, we then um, the the double-a team in Wichita came because in 1985 uh, we we're ready felt we were ready to get into triple-a uh, well, you just can't go to like the third aisle at Tops and buy a AAA franchise. So he got the blue book out and he called every owner in the International League and offered them a million dollars cash. This is 1985. Million dollars cash for their franchise. And I'll give you the AA one if you want it. And um, only one owner, and I won't say who it was, said, geez, I could really use the money. But again, they'd run us out of town. We, I couldn't sell it to you. So then he looks and he said, why not the American Association? So we got to fly a little bit. And we found one owner there, uh, Milton Glickman from Wichita, whose son Dan was a U.S. congressman. And um, he's, he was getting up there in age. He also owned the NBC uh, college tournament. And um, so Bob, he says, you know, Mr. Rich, I like this. He says, when can you come down here? And he said, well, hold on. It was like a Tuesday afternoon. Calls his pilot, and he says, well, how quick be, can we get to Wichita? So we'll be there by 6. He says, Milton, we'll be there at 6 p.m. tonight at this field. I'll pick you up. And he takes him to, like, the Buffalo Club of Wichita, and he's like the Mr. Hey, Mr. Baseball. It's like Russ, you know, gets on his plane. He calls. He says, there's no way this guy's selling us the team. He's Mr. Baseball, you know. Sure enough, he sold us the franchise under the auspices that we would move our double-A team and we would own it and own the... Uh, so we did that, and we did a contest of name the team. We call them the Wranglers. But here, we put the contest up, and um, we had a committee, and a lot of candidates came in. In fact, I was just looking up Wikipedia, so you could do Jamestown Jammers as had its own Wikipedia page, and it explains the background of Jammers. But the committee in Buffalo picked... Uh, 
jammers out of uh, the candidates that came in. How did that really happen? They people oh, put their just... names in, and the committee said jammers, <laughs> and we came up with a logo. But this, you know, there's something significant about that logo that was up there. Um, the tarp skunks. You know, I've got to say, in all the years I was here, I never saw a skunk, but I saw the tarp. I think it's brilliant what you did in that video is brilliant. Does that now mean you're going to play that music as a theme song? So now you have to get the investors or the city to get a, a big screen board so you can show the video at the ballpark. But well, on your logo, if you notice on the tail of the skunk, there's the Wonder Boy logo that's on Robert Redford's bed. If you look closely at that. Really? And also, Frank was mentioning number nine. Number nine was Ro Robert Redford's favorite number in baseball after, you know, Ted Williams. But he, and Robert Redford, little known fact, it's in the book though. Um, and they'll be available in June if anyone wants to get that copy. 1999, no problem. But um, Robert Redford went to college and played college baseball with Don Drysdale. And obviously Drysdale went on to fame with the Dodgers and Redford went to the movies and he didn't get to wear number nine until he was in Buffalo as Roy Hobbs in The Natural. You're just a fount of knowledge. So 1994, we are introduced to Mike Bellani in Jamestown with a vengeance and he came down a lot. And among the uh, uh, ideas was, as I mentioned earlier today, was the concept of history, capturing history and documenting history, which then led to many of you in the audience to assist us in doing history uh, research and the microfilm, which ultimately led to the Dave Millet book, which ultimately will be likewise out soon. Uh, Mike was really the, the, the main man here as the general manager. He was down here in Jamestown a lot. And towards the end of the 1994 season, if I remember right, we were on a real run, and we got it. It was sort of playoff potential. We had a game, which I'm telling you, we would all, mark, some of you probably were at, it was in 1994, we had to beat Batavia and to get into the playoff. Bob was there, Mindy was there, John was there, Mike was there, I'm videotaping, and there was this radio guy, radio guy running up and down the aisles, getting everybody hyped up. And frankly, unless you knew real closely who that radio personality was, it was Mike Ferguson. And uh, I'm sure we were sitting together, and you're, hey, who the hell is this guy? Because he's as if an, uh, you know, a mascot of sort, getting everybody revved up. But that was one Mike Ferguson. So Mike, how, how did you give us a little bit of your background? Because you're a Buffalo native. You're a Buffalo, Buffalo native, native, found your way to Fredonia, and then, yep. uh, then onto, the, onto the local radio. Um, Strange background, and, and, and the, the biography grows every day, but um, talk about the way things come around in circle. Mike and I first met each other. Um, I was on the radio in WBUZ, the only radio station in America to lose its license by the FCC at that time. And uh, I had nothing to do with that. But um, Fredonia, that was a Fredonia station. Go. And I was actually up and at uh, WBEN and a couple other places up in Buffalo as an intern at that time. He came down, did this. And uh, there was a young man in Fredonia who was suffering from uh, liver cancer, Derek Perryman. So we started this thing, Derek Perryman Liver Fund. And uh, I had appeared, I remember when Twin Fair was still up, I was riding a bicycle for 24 hours, stationary bike, and trying to do all these crazy things. Mike read about it in the paper and said, we want to help, Bisons want to help, because of course he was trying to do these promotions. And Mike came up with the uh, bring a liver to the ballpark uh, night, free admission, to try to save Derek Perryman. But the idea was a portion of the ticket sales would go to help Derek with this, uh, with this surgery. And uh, I, came up to, uh, I came back up to the rock pile at that time, and uh, we met Mike, and we had a great night that night, and, that was it. We, we hadn't seen each other uh, for, for a very, very long time, but I grew up going to the Rock Pile. And I grew up with all the things, uh, you know, the old War Memorial Stadium to watch the Bisons hockey and uh, going to the Rock Pile and walking in and hearing the, 
you know, all the, all the same stuff, the crack of the bat, you know, the snap of the glove, you can smell the popcorn and hear the vendors. And it was just like going to church for me. You know, you'd, you'd walk into this cathedral and uh, of, of people just enjoying life and watching a great baseball game. And um, it, was, it was tremendously inspiring to me. And the same thing with, uh, with, the, uh, with the auditorium. And I don't know how many years later, all of a sudden I'm being invited to lunch by Greg Peterson, Russ Dietrich, and Mike Bellani. And uh, I do want to say one thing that Mike forgot, I, I don't, I'm sure he didn't forget about. When they were getting ready to film The Natural, they had just repainted War Memorial Stadium to red, white, and blue. Different sections of the, of the stadium were red, white, and blue. The paint hadn't even dried yet. And the very first thing that the producer of the movie said was, the whole stadium needs to be battleship gray. And they had to repaint the entire stadium for the movie, battleship gray. But uh, I'm sure it was a headache for him. So we met at the town club. And they said, uh, how'd you like to get in baseball? I said, well, I'm a little too old for that, but what are you thinking about? And uh, Mike bestowed upon me the exact title that Bob Rich gave to him, which was the director of, what was it? Director of uh, publicity, publicity promotions, promotions and marketing. marketing, and group sales. He threw group sales in there too. But, um, and I did that part time for a few weeks. And Mike said, you know, if you, uh, if you do this, I can promise we'll make you a general manager. And uh, I came on board, was very, very excited, did it in between my radio gigs. And shortly thereafter, um, there was change. Sean Riley was the general manager under Mike at that time. And then uh, his assistant, Christine, was, uh, took over for a little bit. And at the end of that season, uh, I became the general manager of, of uh, Jammers Baseball. And, you know, I just absolutely loved, this is my first time, growing up in Buffalo, I couldn't tell you where Fredonia or Jamestown was. And I just fell in love with Jamestown because of people like Russ Dietrich and Greg Peterson and Dungeons and, uh, and my good friend Paul Lombardo, who I don't see enough of except, thank God, Facebook's around. Uh, and so many other people that, some of the greatest people I ever met were here in Jamestown, New York. And um, so it was an honor, it was a pleasure you know, I felt like, like I was being asked to, uh, by royalty, to, to take the scepter and, and run with something that Russ had and Greg had worked on for so many years. And we took that same mentality that Mike brought. He said, Mike, every game's an event. Every game's an event. Every game's show. And you know at that time we were the Detroit Tigers farm, farm system. And uh, I had nothing to do with the success or failure of the team, obviously. We had great coaches, we had great managers, we had great team. I always took credit for it when we won, uh, but if we lost, it was always the manager's fault. But um, the idea being is that we had to put butts in seats. That was it. And we came up with a philosophy that if you wanted it to be a family atmosphere, you had to please everybody in the family, from the kids, the mom, Mom's having a good time. Dad wants to do a ball game. You're going because of the experience they had the last time. And of course, Dad, you know, we had a family of baseball fans, but more importantly, we had a family of Jammers fans, of Jamestown Jammers fans. So we did some pretty wild stuff, and um, some stuff that I don't know at this level has been uh, done before or, or since. Uh, we ended up in four books that you can get on Barnes and Noble and Amazon about some of our adventures. Uh, we were having on national television for having the only open air toilet above home plate anywhere in America or the North America. Uh, we ended up on the CBS Sunday morning show for that. Um, By the way, also a uh, baseball card is, uh, is, is out there on that. And you should say how you reacted one day to a bad call on the field. <laughs> yeah, it was always a mystery who threw that roll of toilet paper onto the field. And uh, that was me. I just happened to be in what they affectionately called my office during the game. And uh, it was a horrible call. Uh, it was a, clearly a home run that was hit out in the left field. And they claimed that the ball had curved out. I wasn't too happy about it and happened to have a couple extra rolls of toilet paper there at the time. And they ended up on the field. Uh, <coughs> 
pretty much like the copy of Bully Wooly that Todd Peterson used to play after every home run. He said it was a tradition, and I told him if I hear Bully Wooly one more time, I said I'm going to throw the CD out onto the field. And uh, I said, mix it up a little bit. You know, we want player intros. We want batters. We want music for the batters. And I said, come on. This is major leagues. Let's go. Well, I came back to the stadium next night, and all I hear is home run, bully woolly. And there's Todd, and there's Jim Riggs up there. <laughs> Jim's got his head down. I came up. I hit the eject button. And I took the CD right out the window, right out onto the field. I said, there. Take, you know, take that. Went back downstairs. Two innings later, Jammers hit another home run. All of a sudden, he heard Bully Wooly. <laughs> Went back up again, took it. I didn't throw it on the field. Stuck it in my pocket. Todd opened up his envelope, and he said, I can do this all night long. <laughs> he just kept making more copies of the CD again and again and again. Eventually, we came to a, a, a term that, you know, I was... Uh, I love baseball. It was in my heart. I'm a baseball purist, but uh, I didn't exactly sit well with Mr. Peterson and Mr. Riggs because they thought that I was trying to, do, uh, trying to put on a show, which we were. And I'm glad to see that the skunks are going to do the same thing because that's what brings people to the product. And then the product itself, you fall in love with it. And uh, we were happy to be able to do that. But what he did do is he defied the rule that Bob and Mindy gave us when we started is that uh -oh. the difference between a, a general manager at the quote-unquote minor league level or collegiate level and the big league level is that we're responsible for everything outside the white lines and they're responsible for everything within the white lines and the sooner we learn that, the better. So you did that back in 83, 84 at War Memorial Stadium. We had a similar bad call. And we used to have two-way radios, and back then the press box was right up above home plate. So I, we had, uh, you know, trying to make it unique and different. I had a guy bring in his uh, uh, keyboard and play it like a piano, an old-fashioned, you know, baseball park. And I said, play the song. And he said, are you sure? Play the song. And it was three blind mice. <laughs> <laughs> and the umpire looked up and went like this. And he stopped. I said, play the song. And he said, he told me to stop. play the song. We did it again. And that he, <laughs> the only piano player, sound man who got thrown out of the ballpark. <laughs> well, then unfortunately, I did it again. When you talk about throwing it on, we were in Denver and for a playoff game. We are up 2-0 in a best of five series. We had to win one of three games in Denver. Lost the uh, game three, so now we're in game four. We are down by nine runs, and here comes the, uh, the winning run across the – tying run across the plate and um, in the bottom of the ninth, and Scott Potter was the umpire, clearly safe, and called him out, Terry. Now, this – we are playing in uh, Mile High Stadium. Dugouts are, or clubhouse way down at the end of – you know, so he had to walk 100 yards. Terry, the players are all over him. I went ballistic. I jump on the field. I'm after him, and I end up getting thrown out and fined by the league the next day. So, well, we didn't finish the story about the toilet paper. Um, I ran into the office, and I said, "Get the mascot," because I was I was really upset. Game would have been done and over with that home run. I told the mascot, "I said, come on in here. I don't want you to get in trouble. Take off the uniform." I got a big stick. And I put up a sign, wrote up a sign that said, this is fair, this is foul. And I put on the J.J. Jammer costume, and I ran out to the outfield fence. And in between innings, I waved the sign to the referee. I climbed the fence, sat up there, this is fair, this is foul. Went to the other side and got behind the scoreboard, did the same thing. Well, after the game, they came looking for the mascot. And the umpire said, uh, you know, we're going to suspend your, your mascot. And, and I said, yeah, I don't know what he is. He said, the umpire said, the funny thing is that, that mascot put on about 50 pounds between the fourth <laughs> inning and the sixth inning. And I said, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. He said, stand up. He said, yeah, he said, it looked a lot like that mascot that was sitting out there in, in the field. I said, 
don't know what you're talking about. And he smiled and he walked away. But uh, that's the extent that, that uh, we, we, we took some of those things. And it was, it was an, just an incredible, incredible time. Well, let, me, let me interrupt right now because one, the guy who was unable to be here, Dave Wallenzone, David's uh, attending a funeral. That's why he sends his regrets. But I must interject the story. Sure. Uh, David, uh, two of them actually. David, uh, and this all kind of deals with, as you know, the press box, the press box, which, by the way, by the way, magically, before the season starts, that's going to be our executive suites. You don't know this, first time ever at uh, Dietrich Park, that that box, you go in, you turn to the right, mm -hmm. you know, and there's, there's rooms. Oh, nice. Awesome. Yeah, and Julie Dudgeon's a, the chairman of that committee, along with uh, Bruce Lindquist, you're part of that. Bruce, you know that, didn't you? Yeah, yeah I thought so. And uh, Gary Henry, they're going to remodel that, so that'll have some activity. Well, you've got to keep the toilet, though, because that'll be Well, absolutely. Take. You can't help but see the toilet, because it's from that toilet. For those who haven't been up there, th there is really a toilet up there, and you can open up the window, and you can be sitting on that toilet and watching the game. It is the ultimate crown moment. And throw um, toilet paper. Exactly. <laughs> so... Uh, Two, two ball and zone stories. One is, if you ever wondered where David was, David was down there, and he's a, he's a character extraordinaire. Uh, and he, he sort of disappear once the opening pitch, you know, it just disappeared. And you would see, if you looked at the press box and to the left of the press box from the field, kind of this waft of smoke, the cigar ring of smoke. And you knew that David was up there pretending he was George Steinbrenner. You know, that's where he was. Of course, the city park, no smoking, but when you all of a sudden this ring of cigar smoke, and that was Welland's own. But the, the, the one he was fearful that I would bring up if he were here, and I would not bring it up, I would show it, because it's on video. We had, by the schedule gods, the first game of the return of Brooklyn professional baseball. Mm -hmm. So I think the Dodgers left in 1957. Mm -hmm. They then became Second. part of the expansion team in the New York Penn League. The first game here, Jamestown, an away game for them. Here we are. So we, uh, doing a little bit of Bolani, Ferguson, P.T. Barnum, we reached out to Carl Erskine. Carl Erskine, the great pitcher for the Dodgers who would throw out the first pitch, the first game back, Jamestown would get the splash. And that, in fact, did happen. Uh, we, I gave to Carl as he was going out to warm up to throw out the first pitch. And every New York City, you know, USA Today, everybody covered the damn thing because it was Brooklyn returning to baseball. So he put on a jammer's hat. Carl, nice, gracious. Nobody thought on the Brooklyn side to give him a Brooklyn hat. How crazy was this? So the first pitch, all the interviews that you see on you know, New York City was with the Jammers hat. Great. We pulled it off. Well, one of the things he could play was harmonica. He could play the harmonica and was designed that at the seventh inning stretch, it'd be taking me out to the ball game. So this is where it gets interesting. So I'm ushering Carl, ladies and gentlemen, Carl Erskine, Brooklyn Dodgers, great to play, take me out to the ball game. <sighs> the roar, the cameras are, there's got to be 10 cameras watching this. And David is so nervous that, of course, you remember he had to bring out the mic, and then there was mm -hmm. the cord. And he had not put the two together, the cord with the microphone. So he's panicked out there because, you know, Carl, he's getting ready, and there's no sound. So he pulls the cord and puts it in to the microphone, and guess what? He broke the peg. He got so nervous, you know, boom, 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 and broke the peg, so therefore, hence, no sound. And so we had to wave off, wave off, for those that might remember, the seventh inning stretch, Carl Erskine, and we then, you know, he, David's sweating profusely. You know, what do I do, what do I do? And we're going to go upstairs, and for the first time ever in the history of professional baseball, going to have playing of take me out of the ball game at the top of the eighth inning. Never occurred ever. There you go. So we all crawled up into the press box, and there had, and you'll see pictures of it, there had been t 10 cameras kind of squeezed in there, and ladies and gentlemen, for the first time ever in the history of baseball, Carl Erskine, take me out to the ball game, top of the eighth inning. And that became one of uh, his signature pieces, but he was an absolute wreck. And of course, I film it. It's on YouTube should you want to see that. And, and David uh, has other stories, and I don't, that's up to you guys if you want to talk about David. But uh, 
You know, one of the things I remember, and I, and I want Mike to talk about his ability to get people engaged. Everybody's got one of these, and you're often caught in situations where you can't work your way out of a situation where you're having conversation. I learned something from Mike Bellani, and he's, he's done it a million times. Where you're with somebody and you want to end the conversation, he would say, he'd pull out his camera. He'd say, everybody get together. Everybody get together. And there was no, no film in his camera, but he would take a picture. And he'd say, thank you very much. Appreciate it. We'll look forward to seeing you again. And then exit from the conversation. That's a Mike Bellani type moment. Yeah, but what, there was film. <laughs> we'd have them copied, and then we'd send the, right. uh, the photo to someone. <laughs> They're like, oh, my gosh. But, you know, it, it's interesting. And I have to say, out of all the GMs, the one I'm most proud of that I think, you know, really did uh, a yeoman's job was... Uh, was Mike, uh, you know, Ferguson. And I'd say that with David sitting here. I mean, this guy put his heart and soul into the job and, um, or now his half a heart into the, uh, <laughs> the job, but um, he, just, he just bled, uh, you know, Jammer baseball and really Jamestown baseball. But an interesting point that I, and I haven't had a chance to really spend a lot of time with Frank, but I, I think from your background and talking to him earlier, meeting him in, uh, when we were here in the summer, that he has uh, what it's going to take to uh, make it a success here. Regardless of whether it's an affiliated team or a collegiate level team, you know, it's, as Russ pointed out, it's baseball. And as, you know, June pointed out, much like my wife, who's the accountant uh, person and the finance person, it's a business. And at the end of the day, um, you could have all the fun you want, but it has to at least um, you know, break even or at least make a dollar. You know, you don't want to be in this to lose money. Um, the challenge, the, the good thing that I heard is that you come to the 29 um, game uh, skunk tar, tarp skunk games this year, and it'll be a lot of fun with a baseball game um, included. And I think that in this day and age where there's so much competition, for the entertainment dollar, um, you have to have that kind of uh, uh, zaniness or that kind of activity to make it a fun experience, as Mike pointed out, to attract you know the families, the purists, um, everyone to come out here. And I think the challenge, um, it's great to see the 30 or so investors you know that you have, I mean, I see, you know, many of you uh, I recognize from, you know, when we were back here uh, way back then. But as Frank pointed out, um, the need for um, the corporate um, and political and civic community to come up to a system, both in the um, sponsorships to fill, you know, the signs in the park to show support, the ticket sales, but buying tickets is, in, is only half of it. You gotta put people in the stands. And people have to come into the ballpark and somehow in those 29 games, they have to make um, that the place to be in Jamestown that night. It's been great to see you have the support of the newspaper and the media here, and they have to get behind it. And it just can't be an afterthought or relying on them to spend all kinds of you know, money to promote and advertise because they just don't have that kind of money. I mean, social media certainly will help. Um, but then I think the opportunity with this college team, and I was talking to the manager earlier, to promote these young players. I mean, the Dungeons led the league in it last time of, you know, we had houses for the kids to stay and we made it more of a, a nice community, you know, for them to be in. But you've got some great stories. I mean, there's going to be some good, you know, college players that are going to be coming in here this year. And then, um, you know, certainly they're not here in the Tigers organization that next year they'll be in AA and in three years they may be in the big leagues or maybe never. But these guys you could continue to follow. It's a new sort of baseball history that's going on. And as for the, the staff, when he was saying he's only got two or three people there. When we first got a, the, the New York Penn League franchise, we didn't know where we were going with it. We, we bought a franchise. 
The first place we went was Batavia. And we had a, a couple graduates of Bonaventure that brought us to Batavia, and we sat with the president of St. Bonaventure. And we said, we want to deliver you this franchise only if we could use this franchise as a, uh, uh, an incubator for your students to run. And we, we want the, we'll teach the student how to run a baseball franchise. Now Niagara University is doing that. Um, the, the school literally owns the college franchise that plays at Sal Magley. And they have a sports management major, and those students are running that franchise. You know, you're coaching at uh, JCC. J they should be involved helping with, from an internship standpoint, the business students uh, getting creative and working with uh, Frank and his staff. That's how you integrate, you know, the community. Because you have to really make it an event here so that the people will look forward to coming out. And then the players, um, all I can say, and we used to go in and talk to our players before the season, and it was Bob's only time going in and interfering, and he'd hold up his ring finger and say, see my naked finger? All I want's a championship. <laughs> and I went a little further, and I said, look, I really don't care what you do on the road. You could lose every road game, but don't lose at home, especially on Friday nights. Now, it always didn't work out that way, but um, I'm a firm believer, and I, I love, what's his name, the doctor, with the, um, the creative um, uh, thinking and the, um, what's the stuff, he, what's he, the, the motivational yeah. and yep. imaging and all that? When we were looking at spring training sites, we went into uh, uh, Chicago, and they had just opened up a new facility in Sarasota. So uh, the owner, Jerry Reinsdorf, was taking us around, and we walk into the locker room, and um, who walks out of the shower? You know, he had towels around, but Michael Jordan. So being the, you know, we do say hello, so everyone goes this way, Michael's going to a stall, and I'm a former reporter. So I said, Michael, can I ask you a question? Sure. And I said, why do you always want the last shot of every game in basketball? You know, forget being a baseball player. And he looked at me and he said, you've got to visualize what you want to realize. He said he would get on the plane, and, and the charter that, the, that Reinsdorf got for the, the Bulls you walk on the plane, the first seat is Michael's. There's no seat next to him, and there's no row, you know, behind him. It's just him alone. He said he'd put his headset on of his game day music, and he literally visualized the bus pulling up to, say, Madison Square Garden, getting out and saying hello to Joe, the security guard. And he would go through the entire game that night um, before he got there. And he said... In, a, in that, he made every shot. In the game, well, not always, but he said it always put him in a position that he was uh, going to realize, you know, wow, I've been here before. And he'd put up the shot and make it. So, and he got his players thinking that of, you got to visualize we're going to win that championship. And so I've done that with some other teams, and I hope they do that with these guys. Because really, as a college in this sport, I mean, you're just in high school. This is an opportunity that you can look back on and say, wow, this was the greatest summer of my life, and we won a championship. And I'm sure you do it, Coach, all the time, but, you know, if they can believe they're literally better than what their skills should be if they play together as a team and visualize that we want to own that tarp here in Jamestown and just go on that field thinking there's no way they're going to beat us here. So just my two cents from a number of years being in there and being around some of the guys. And, you know, if you take one of my favorite athletes, and unfortunately he passed, was Kobe Bryant, because I just admired what this guy did in preparation. And if you watch the memorial the other day and Michael Jordan saying, man, this guy would call me at 3 in the morning asking about how I move my feet. He's like, what? And it, they, it built a tremendous friendship. But Michael said... I've never seen any player who left it all on the court when the final buzzer went off. So, and That's something that, that Mike had taught me was vis visualization about where you want to be. I mean, think about, you know, I'm a doofus on the morning radio show here in Jamestown, and suddenly 
Uh, you have three weeks to put together your baseball budget. Uh, okay. You know, never having run a baseball team before ever. And I appreciate what you said, Mike, but, you know, we have a great team. I would not have been able to do the things that I was able to do because the people who really ran the team was Julie Dudgeon and Norma Marvell. Those two people ran the team uh, behind the scenes, behind the wall, so that we could do the things, the goofy things that, uh, that I did. I remember being up on top of the dugout, and one of the things I would always do is pick the wrong time to be on the dugout. The uh, coach would always tell me, you're supposed to be on the dugout when the visiting team's up to bat, not when we're up to bat. And we'd throw baseballs, actual baseballs, out into the crowd one night. And I was sitting there, and a couple of the players' parents would always sit behind home plate. And uh, so I'm throwing baseballs out there, and the people in the center behind the net were always say, you never throw anything to me, and they're waving and everything else. Well, I took this ball, and I threw it, didn't think anything of it. And suddenly, everybody's standing up and cheering. In fact, I think Derwood was one of them. They're going, ah, ah, ah. And I'm, wow, these people are greedy. I just threw two balls over there. Well, one of them hit one of the parents dead in the temple and knocked them out. <laughs> And his son was in the dugout. Um, and, and there were some things, talk about things that had never happened before. Uh, sadly, one of the things that happened is we were the first team to cause a stoppage in New York Penn baseball since the Second World War. And one of the reasons, that reason why we had to stop uh, play was because of the death of Dwight, uh, Dwight Lowry. Dwight was the catcher for the Detroit Tigers. His claim to fame was he was on the on-deck circle when a guy by the name of Kurt Gibson came up to bat. They took, they took a Dwight out, and the rest is history. And Dwight was one of the nicest men you ever want to meet. And uh, there was a history to this season. And everything I'm about to tell you is true. Mike Bellani can vouch for it. Although Mike used to say that there was always 18,000 people at every Bison's game. So the authenticity of his... We <laughs> sold 18,000. Paid, 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 paid. Paid seats. Right. But um, what happened is we had won, won a game, lost a game, won a game, lost a game. And we won two games back to back. And I went into the locker room and said, great job, sir, Congratulations. He says, yeah. He said, I'm sorry it took this long to win two back-to-back. -back. He said, but I said, how are you feeling? He said, I think I'm coming down a little bit of a cold. Well, we were always all fired up as a staff after a game. And many of us would stand out in the parking lot at the end of the game to just talk and rehash and think about what we could do better the next game. And um, Dwight came out of the locker room, and he was walking back home to his house that they had rented here in Jamestown. And I said, wow, for all the money they pay you guys, you think you'd be able to buy a car? Just kidding around. And he said, I love walking home after a game. It clears my head. Nice fresh air. And he walks home. And I drive back to Fredonia, and I'm laying in bed, and my wife wakes me up in the middle of the night and says, uh, the team manager's on the phone. He says, got to talk to you right away. And yeah, I'm in that REM sleep that I can't seem to get into anymore in my age. And uh, I said, well, I, tell him I'll call him back. I uh, try to wake up, and I fell back to sleep. My wife wakes me up and says, you've you got to answer the phone. I said, what's the problem? He said, Dwight didn't make it. And I'm thinking, didn't make it. We're, at, we're on a homestand. He didn't take a bus. What, what the heck happened? So I talked to him, and he says, Dwight died after he went home. Took out the garbage. His wife and kids were still up. Came back in, fell down on the floor in the dining room. And uh, what do you do? So I called Marnie, our marketing, our PR director, and I said, Marnie, gather the boys. I said, we got to get back to, the, back to the stadium. I'm on my way. I'm going to get in my car. I'm going to go. She goes, how do you expect me to find all the boys? I said, you're at the rusty nail. I can hear you. They're all there. <laughs> gather them up and get them back to the stadium. And she said, why? What's wrong? I said, just get them back to the stadium. Well, by then, the word had gotten around. I pulled into the stadium and almost hit several of the players. They were all over the parking lot, various stages of sadness and grief, crying. 
Uh, I woke up whatever uh, religious leaders in the community I could find at that time of the night, and they came in to console the, uh, uh, the players. And I remember Matt Martin was just over from Cincinnati, and he was, he'd only been in Jamestown for a couple of days, and he was standing in the shower, fully clothed, but just standing there crying. And I said, Matt, what's wrong? I said, did you know Dwight well? He said, no, not really. I said, well, why are you crying? He said, I'm going to have to coach in Jamestown, New York now. <laughs> and I said, well, don't worry. It's a great place to be. And I called the head of the minor league uh, operations for the Detroit Tigers. And I said, we're going to have to cancel tomorrow's game. I said, there's no way these guys are going to stand in front of a 90-mile-an-hour fastball. They're not ready, you know. Dwight's gone, blah, blah, blah. And just everything just came to a standstill. We had some amazing people that helped put together a memorial. And some of the biggest names in baseball came to Jamestown for that memorial service. Dwight's wife and children were here. She knew nobody other than our staff uh, and some of the players. And uh, we finally got back to regular baseball. Well, then what happened from that point on is we won, we lost, we won, we lost. And every time we won two in a row, all of a sudden John Spalier's father died. Norma's, uh, Norma who ran the office, I forget who it was that passed away in, in her family. And every time, well, one of the players came in, he said, Mr. Ferguson, this has been going on since spring training. Every time we went two in a row, something bad happens. Somebody's gone. Fast forward uh, to the last game of the season. We're all in the brand new stadium in Erie, played Seawolves. Doubleheader because the second game, the game was rained out earlier in the season. And Greg Mayer and Bernie Walsh, former FBI agent who always dreamed of being a play-by-play -play announcer, was the color man. We won the first game. Second game, we were losing by five runs. And a uh, pitcher came in. His name was Matt, I believe, right? Matt Winters. Uh, came in and uh, finished the game. Big comeback, we win. Two in a row. The very first thing, Greg Mayer turn, turns off the microphone and says, we just won two games in a row. And I said, Psh, nothing more can happen. There's no way anything else can happen. So what was traditional is all the players get on the bus, they go back to the stadium. We have to check them in, give them their last check from the Detroit Tigers, check in all their equipment, check in everything. Some of them were staying overnight. Some were going to remain at the uh, uh, stadium to practice. And some were leaving completely. Um, one of the players gave me his dog that he bought from a girl on 2nd Street because she needed food. And uh, I brought home this puppy that my wife said, I can't believe you brought home a dog. But um, we go home, check everybody out. All of a sudden, the phone rings, 2 o'clock in the morning. And it's Mr. Miller, who again is the head of minor league baseball for the Detroit Tigers. He said, how you doing? I said, Glad the season's over. He said, I got bad news. He said, Matt was on his way home, was killed in a head-on car crash on the 90. Our back-to-back -back two games, and the winning pitcher was killed. The headlines on the Post Journal was the season from hell is finally over. And uh, you know, I have that in my office. It was just a incredibly uh, bad season from that standpoint. For those of you who remember, we also had a little bit of a hysterical uh, event when we had two very young bat boys, or not bat boys, clubhouse managers, who were lured by friends into the parking lot under a fake fight. They faked this, this fight. Well, all the party goers hopped the fence, ran into the locker room, and stole every one of the jammers' uniforms. Every single one of them. And uh, so what do you do again? So for the next two weeks, within 24 hours, the Detroit Tigers sent 
complete Major League Baseball uniforms. And we were the Detroit Tigers for at least two weeks. Well, Chuck D'Angelo was the attorney at that time. And called and he said, uh, I think I got one of the kids, but you know, his, they're from a fairly well-to-do family. And I said, okay. He said, uh, if the kid comes in and works, does some public service, you know, community service, would you let him off the hook? I said, every single jersey and uniform has got to be back in my office in the next 48 hours. Not one can be missing. Secondly, you, you would be stupid to walk the streets wearing the uniforms because if you remember the Jammers uniforms at that time, which were white with the red pin stripe and the black lettering, we never made replicas. So if you're on the street wearing one, you're wearing an actual jersey, which means you were somehow involved. Until the Batavia Muck Dogs, if you remember, stole their jerseys the next season, the ideas of the jerseys. But we turned around and uh, he worked very, very hard. And a young man came in, he said, I found all but one. He said, uh, Chuck called me, he said, what do you think? You're gonna let him off the hook? He said, the deal was all the jerseys and all the uniforms. I said, at that time, there was no alarm system on the stadium. So I said, if we let this go, it's going to be open season on a ballpark. Um, and speaking of Chuck and speaking of the type of people that we have in Jamestown, because many of you are in that same mold, which I appreciate of it, Chuck uh, used to bring his kids to the ballpark every summer to do, we'd say, oh, great, I need interns. Nope. They're free help. I teach my kids how to give back to the community. And there are so many families like that in Jamestown. And his kids would work at the stadium for free during the day, doing things that nobody saw during regular games. But uh, it was really, uh, it, it, it spoke volumes about the people of Jamestown and the people of Chautauqua County. And I always remember that, that every summer you could bet that Chuck was going to come in with his kids. And his kids would be working in the stadium uh, doing things long before anybody came to the ballpark. So, and we thank you, thank you for those things. Mike, before I give Mike Bolani the final word, before we call up, you got this mustard bottle sitting there for a reason. Tell the story. One of the, one of the great things that, uh, that we always pride ourselves on was just unusual promotions. And uh, I think this was Paul Lombardo that really inspired this because uh, he's, I think he's one of the greatest Cleveland Indian fans. The Bisons were obviously with the Indians at that time. And uh, we have both Yankees and Indians fans in, here in uh, Chautauqua County. We were looking for something a little bit different. We'd introduced uh, at your seat service. Uh, if you remember, we also had full service Friday, the one night there. But I had called uh, Mr. Bertman, his family, because this is the famous Bertman ballpark mustard, which was only, only served at Cleveland Indian Stadium. That's the only place you can get it. So uh, we called the family, and he had just passed away a couple years earlier, and I was talking to his wife. And I said, you know, our, our home parent company is the Buffalo Bisons, and they're a Cleveland Indians affiliate. But we're here in Jamestown, New York. She goes, I know where Jamestown is. And I said, we've got a tremendous number of Cleveland Indians fans here. And I said, and they all talk about your mustard. I said, I would be honored if you would give us the opportunity to carry your mustard in the stadium. She said, well, you know, our history is that mustard has never been anywhere but Cleveland Stadium. She said, but you sound like a nice young man. so." I'll let you do that. And so we were the only ballpark outside of Cleveland Stadium to ever serve Burtman Ballpark Mustard. And uh, I picked this up, and my wife and I were coming back from seeing our son down south. And as you drive through Ohio and the different rest areas, they sell Ohio-based products, and one of them was Burtman's Mustard. So I, I brought some tonight for Paul, so I'll make sure I, I give that to him. But, I, I could sit here and talk for hours about the promotions, Sky Jam, about the night, the very first night I tried running fireworks at the ballpark, and we, it's where the dormitories are now uh, at JCC, and the wind happened to be blowing in, and Mike Bellani was there to, and we all had our walkie-talkies. Every, every employee had a walkie-talkie. 
and suddenly the wind was blowing this way and shooting the fireworks into the stadium. They weren't going up, they were coming into the stadium, into the press box, PA guys are ducking and radio guys are ducking, and Mike's standing on the walkie-talkie saying, Ferguson, turn off the fireworks, stop the fireworks. And I'm, how the hell do you want me to stop the fireworks? There's no, they weren't automated at the time. And somebody's on a golf cart zipping out to JCC property to find a way to turn off the fireworks. And meanwhile, people were scattering because all the sparks were flying into the stadium and uh, all kinds of things. But those were just the things that we were, uh, you know, I, I wrote down, uh, that's why I keep looking at my phone is, uh, there, there's so many memories, but I had written down seven different things that, that really stuck out in, in my mind. And um, I'm not going to share the rest of them with you. Uh, Mike always told me I should write a book back then. That's what he tells everybody is write a book, document. Uh, but I will, I will finish with this, the Bolani tie challenge. I was always impressed the very first time I met Mike. He had this uh, Norman Rockwell baseball tie. Okay, and I thought that was cool. And I thought, this is the best guy in the business. He was, you know getting all these accolades as, uh, didn't you win the Rawlings Award for executive, baseball executive of the year, all these other things. You gotta do what the, what the best do. And I went out and started getting baseball ties. All of a sudden, he'd have a different baseball tie, I have a different baseball tie. My wife, Diane, says, you have to stop. And so what's wrong? You have 68 baseball ties <laughs> in your career there. And I said, yeah, okay, that's enough. But uh, that was our legacy, and I will be forever indebted to the gentleman in this room and this gentleman because we have become very good friends. He's one of those people that we don't see each other that often, and we do. Uh, you know, we just I love the man and uh, love you and Jamestown for allowing me to do what I did in the years that I was here. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Well, one final personal story, and then I'll let Mike Bellani conclude because he only he can conclude the way he concludes. Um, this, I'm not sure the exact year, but there was a, a a legislation proposed in Washington uh, dealing with the antitrust and 1990. dealing with 1990. And so uh, my buddy Mike Bellani calls me, Greg, I need somebody to shadow me. We're going down, we're going to lobby Henry Hyde, we're going to lobby all of the New York delegation. And so can you meet me down there? And I say, hey, what a chance of a lifetime. I'm going to be a lobbyist. I'm going to be a lobbyist. We're going to walk through the halls of Congress. And our role was, my role simply was, uh, he handed me a gym bag, and within the gym bag was uniform which had bisons on it, and on the back it had like Paxton and Molinari and, and uh, uh, D'Amato and Moynihan, because we were going to go Houghton, going to go to every one of them, and Mike was going to give them a jersey, they were going to pose in the jersey, there was going to be a photo of the, them in the jersey, and inevitably uh, consent. And Mike had every New York minor league owner, certainly a New York Penn League owner, with him in tow because he had ma managed this. So we're walking around. Including the, Bob Julian. Including Bob Julian, yes. It's, it's, it's a little bit of that on video. So there's the commissioner. And so we end up this wonderful going through the halls of Congress, and I'm having a you know, photo op, meeting, getting autographs, do the things I do, and we're at D'Amato's office. And this is Senator Alphonse D'Amato, Republican. And everybody is outside in the Senate uh, offices of D'Amato. And Mike goes in, meets the receptionist. We're here on behalf of the New York Penn League. We're here, scheduled meeting with Senator Alphonse D'Amato. And the next thing you know, a, congression, or a senatorial aide comes out and says, sorry, the senator is busy. I'll be happy to meet with you. Unacceptable to Mike Bellani, because he's got a whole train of people outside. So he goes outside and picks up his cell phone. I don't know what he's doing other than he's talking to somebody. And he's saying, by the way, I'm here at Senator D'Amato's office. Uh, he said he was going to meet with me, unable to meet me. Can you help me? All of a sudden, five minutes later, guess who comes out? Senator Alphonse D'Amato comes and meets. So I ask Mike, what did you do? And so I'll have him answer that, and then he'll give us the final words. Well, we called a fellow who then later became under uh, second, or, yeah, second or first President Bush, uh, the ambassador to Malta, Tony Joya from Buffalo. 
and he made a quick phone call to uh, Senator D'Amato, and uh, lo and behold, he came out. <laughs> but uh, just before I finish, you could read it in the book that'll be out on June uh, 16th. <laughs> um, we have year by year from 1877 to 2020, and not to top any of Mike's stories, but I can top one. In uh, 1967, on June 30th, the Bisons were playing at War Memorial Stadium, and they had 117 fans at the game. This is when they're affiliated with the Cincinnati Reds. And while those 117 players are watching the players perform, it was at the time, unfortunately, in our um, history, that there were um, race riots going on, and Jefferson Avenue was, you know, the site of all types of uh, turmoil. Well, uh, a bunch of hoodlums broke into the, uh, came in, and the locker rooms were up a ramp and then up these stairs, and those same stairs were O.J. Simpson first went up, and Jack Kemp and Cookie Gilchrist. Well, these guys went up there and literally cleaned out the entire locker room of every piece of clothing of all the players and left. Uh, that, le that was the final game played there. They then moved to uh, Hyde Park and, in Niagara Falls, and three years later, uh, Buffalo lost its AAA franchise to Winnipeg. So that was uh, the first uh, robbery, and yours was the second. Um, I'm just, uh, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, you know, talking baseball, I look forward to coming back in May and seeing these young players. And um, you, can, you can feel here, and I think you can express to the other players, um, you know, that you're part of history. You know, it's a history that, as uh, Russ brought out, goes back to the early, uh, you know, 30s. And um, that's one thing about baseball is that regardless of what league or what team, it's part of the city's, uh, you know, historical fabric. And a lot has gone on here over the years. I think what is being uh, in the, the, the journal every week, and I get it on email, of the history, you know, shown in there just shows that, you know, you're part of something special here. So if you could pass it on to the other players that are going to be here that, you know, when you put on the uh, that special jersey and that unique uh, logo, you know, cap that they are playing for a uh, historical city in, uh, in, ba in, you know, in the annals of baseball. And I look forward to coming down and uh, having a tough time to find a, uh, you know, a place to park and a seat to, uh, you know, get. And then uh, lastly, Greg Peterson will go down in history is he was right when he uh, used his influence and got a hold of Bill Giesel, who got a hold of me and said, here, get this guy a press pass. And I'm just a young, you know, guy in PR there, so I would write, you know, Ed Kilgore, Channel 2, you know, uh, Rick Azar, Channel 7, Greg Peterson, Phillips Lytle Law Firm. <laughs> and you said you work for the law firm. I still don't understand how you can actually get any work done for the law firm when all I hear you do is talk baseball. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Mike Ferguson, Mike Bellani. But hey, I'll give you a fundraiser. You know, the, you know, June is saying, you know, you need to here's a here's a non-traditional revenue stream. Greg has hundreds of videos of one-on-one -on -one interviews over the years. I think you get a, re a red letter committee here to meet some night, go through his collection and maybe come up with the top 50 or 25 or whatever and have a night at the movies with Greg's interviews. And there's some really neat ones there and charge a few bucks to come in and that money will go straight to the kitty that you know June will put in the uh, bank account and will help in the revenue and you'll have some fun reliving some uh, great stories over the years. I must tell you, Russ, go ahead. Well, yeah, you can obviously see that looking at me. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, I've had a pretty interesting career. Um, it's really September 17, 1992 is when my whole baseball career ended in that I was uh, riding a 10-speed bike in Canada. And uh, it really began a month before that when I bought a new bike. And the owner of the bike store knew I used to, um, after every like Friday night game was our biggest night. It would be huge, it would be crazy. So much like your manager who walked home, um, I would get on my bike and drive around the city till four or five in the morning and um, you know, then go home, sleep, and do it all over again the next day. And he said, and he hated our mayor, Jimmy Griffin. He said, you know, our streets are, you hit a pothole and you hit your head, we can't afford to lose you. So you gotta get a helmet. And I said, I'm not gonna spend a hundred, no one wore a helmet unless you were in you know, Tour de France. I'm not gonna spend a hundred bucks. So he throws me the helmet. So he said, if you're gonna give it to me, I'll wear it. Well, fast forward to September of that year, I'm leaving my house, and I'm a pretty spiritual, not pretty, I'm an extremely spiritual person, and who believes when you hear those voices in the back of your head that say, turn left, you better turn left. So I'm leaving the house, and I remember reading, looking and seeing my brother's uh, phone number. He was coming up to see me, and I read the number. Then I'm leaving, I get on my bike, there's no helmet. Well, it's after Labor Day, maybe I already brought it home, I had brought some stuff home. So I'm on the bike, and I'm in the driveway, and the voice screams at me, get off your bike and get your bike helmet. So like a robot, I walk in the garage, there's no bike helmet. I'm leaving, there's a box by the door, I open it up, the only thing in it's a helmet. How it got there, I'll go to my grave, never knowing how it got there. Four days later, I come to an ECMC, and the doctor's holding this helmet, that if you didn't have this on, you'd be dead. I went through 17 hours of trauma surgery, ended up living there 44 days, and when they let me out, I had um, among, I mean, I was a you know, physical therapist's dream, every, it, it was really a whole mess of injuries, but they said you had a slight fractured skull, and you don't tell a quadruple A person, oh, you have a slight anything, because I said, well, if it's slight, it can't be very much. And back then, with occupational therapy, if I could count to five and put three blocks together, you know, you're fine. Well, you know, they said take all of 93 off, and I didn't. And so I, I went back to uh, work at the Bisons. We drew another million fans for the sixth straight year, and then all of a sudden, it just, you know, the brain just collapsed and had like a near nervous uh, breakdown. In fact, I was supposed to be on my way down here and I ended up going in the hospital for a whole battery of tests and they diagnosed it as, um, they call it a bipolar disorder and I look at the psychiatrist and I said, well, what is that? It's a mental illness. And I'm like, well, me, what? And because of the stigma, I said, well, I can't tell anyone that. So I literally went the next 15 years, including the years um, down here. Um, I then changed careers. I left the baseball, started my own business. I wrote the biography of Bob Rich. And then uh, about f 10 or 12 years ago, I went to work for the food bank. Uh, they needed someone in PR. And I was always brought up that no matter how much you had, you know, if someone needed something, give it to them. And our family owns uh, dry cleaners in Kenmore, Colvin Cleaners, um, and when we grew up, we didn't have much. But I remember, and it stuck with me my whole life, is the Sunday before Thanksgiving, our church said, you could either donate this much and we'll buy a turkey for a family in need, or you could take a card and deliver it to the family. So my mom always wanted to take the card, so we would go in and she couldn't just buy the turkey, that is all that was required. She had to get all the trimmings and all that. And we really didn't have a lot to do that, but we got it, put it in a box and we'd go to that family. And what we saw going in that house of what they didn't have stuck with us. So when I went to the food bank, it was um, the opportunity to give back. And um, it was probably one of the best experiences I ever had. And because of food bank, um, takes care of this area, the Food Bank of West New York. I think they've changed their name now, but you have St. Susan's is here, and there's a number of places. In fact, there's a distribution center here. So 
it was a good experience to be able to see the need um, that is here. Um, just to finish up with the uh, head injury, um, that led to bouts of depression that I call managed depression, meaning that I could still work. The only thing that was missing was, you know, the excitable, emotional, creative mic, which a lot of people really liked. Um, but when I came out of it, it was like back to Mr. Creative and all that. So finally, uh, if you don't manage depression very well and you don't reach out to someone, depression is a direct ride in the dark hole to suicide. So I had suicide thoughts um, and even a couple attempts. And each time, you know, the Lord said, well, we're not ready yet, so um, it didn't happen. But after the last one, I saw Jody Lomeo, who runs Kaleida Health and used to run ECMC, and I said, if you don't find the best brain doctor in the world, I'm done promoting ECMC. And lo and behold, they had just hired a brain trauma expert at ECMC um, who put me through a battery of tests and said, well, sorry, good news is you were misdiagnosed. You don't have bipolar disorder. You have a traumatic brain injury that's much easier to manage. He says, if you follow these six things, take your meds, eat healthy, exercise, uh, um, get amount of sleep, no stress, and, uh, and continue to pray, you'll live a life like you never dreamed you could live. And I'm like, yeah, right. And here I am, like, eight or ten years later, like, oh, my God, what's going on now is just an absolute miracle. So on March 11th, I get an award for a Courage to Come Back Award, and rather than accept the award and put it on a shelf, I'm going to use that to start a continue an advocacy I've been doing of trying to end the stigma associated uh, with mental health. That's more than just individually, but, you know, societal-wise of, you know, having people put mental health in the same category as cancer and heart disease and all that, that people don't have to feel ashamed when they, you know, face those kind of issues. So. As I said, I was really looking forward to this, and the, uh, it all became reality. Thank you, Mike Ferguson, Mike Bellani, and for all our friends here as we, we walk out the door, just note that in 2018, uh, four of the players who were part of that team uh, during this collegiate league were, in fact, uh, signed by professional baseball. So you never know uh, when you're watching the guys out there. And um, with that, uh, Say, we stand adjourned. If anybody has any questions, thank you for coming. Appreciate and it. And on your way out, there's a few more souvenir items. There you go, exactly. Thank you. Wow, you, you're going to enjoy those. Oh, I am. Where'd you find it?